Ladies and gentlemen, the President, please rise. Honorable President of India, Sri Pranab Mukherjee Ji, Directors of Sister Institutions, Vice Chancellors of Central Universities, colleagues and my dear young students, let me begin by extending a warm welcome on behalf of one and all to the Honorable President of India on this occasion. The Honorable President of India is, is taking efforts to transform the dreams and aspirations of our youthful nation into reality. It goes without saying that challenges and expectations can be best addressed through collective, coordinated and united efforts. Honorable President is striving to improve the standards of educational institutions across the country by interacting with the Vice Chancellors of Central Universities, Directors of IITs, ISERs, NITs, etc. at Rashtrapati Bhavan. We are indeed fortunate that the head of the, our nation has taken personal initiative to interact directly with the students through video conferencing twice a year on a common forum. The context, guidance and direction given by the President on these occasions are crucial to coordinating and strengthening all the efforts we take towards achieving our common goals. India is a nation of young minds and I am confident that all the revered teachers from across the country united today through this event agrees with me that at this moment in time in our nation's history, it is up to us to make the demographic dividend that time has blessed with us. The young students in this pan Indian audience while being deeply grateful to their teachers want us to strive even harder to impart to them. In ever increasing numbers, the knowledge, wisdom and skills they need for a successful, productive and satisfying life. Today, the Honorable President Sri Pranav Mukherjee Ji will be speaking to us on parliament and policy making. In a young country like India, it is important that the upcoming generation is aware of how a diverse and complex country such as ours with a rich heritage and strong traditions is run and its affairs managed so that they can also participate and eventually take over this process of nation building. On behalf of all the students, teachers and academicians assembled today and on behalf of Isaac Thiruvananthapuram in particular, I invite you sir to deliver your address at the beginning of this new year and new academic talk. Thank you, Vice Chancellors, Directors, Heads of Institutions of higher learning, faculty members, dear students. Let me start by wishing all, you all and your families a very happy and prosperous new year. I'm happy to have the opportunity of sharing some of my thoughts with you at the beginning of the year. I express my appreciation and gratitude to the National Knowledge Network team, particularly Professor S. V. Raghavan and the NIT, NIC team who have made it possible for me 
to reach out to you in such large numbers through this video conference. <clears throat> Last year, it was decided that I will address you twice. Once at the beginning of the new year in January and again at the beginning of the new academic session in August. Friends, the year 2014 was an eventful year for India's polity. After three decades, Indian electorate decided to give a single party the majority to form a stable government outcome of the elections. To the 16th Lok Sabha provides political stability and gives a mandate to the elected government to fulfill its commitment to the people by using its majority in formulating policies and making laws <coughs> to implement those policies. Distinguished <coughs> heads of the institutions, faculty members, and dear students, in a democratic polity, building and strengthening the nation is the collective responsibility of all the major organs of the government. In parliamentary democracy, all three wings, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary are the most important functional organs. All three derive their authority from the Constitution, which clearly defines their role of policy making, legislation, implementation of the policies and programs, and interpreting the law by judiciary as and when required. Today, I have chosen to speak on the theme of parliament and policy making or more generally, on the relationship between law and policy. You would recognize the, that by posing the issues on these lines, the judiciary, along with the parliament and the executive, also become a relevant player in steering the development process in the country. All three organs are expected to cooperate within their limits as prescribed by the Constitution without overstepping them. Friends, in a democracy, the Parliament has three vital functions, representation, lawmaking, and oversight. Though the formulation of policy and initiation of legislation is mainly the function of the executive. Enactment of legislation or its rejection is within the domain of the legislature. Interpretation of law falls in the domain of the judiciary. The parliament stands for the will and aspirations of the people. It is the platform where through debates and deliberations these will and aspirations have to be prioritized and translated into laws, policies, and concrete programs of action. When that doesn't happen, an important element in the functioning of democracy gets compromised to the disadvantage of the people. Friends, law refers to principles and rules codified or enshrined in customary practices established for mediation of social relations between people and communities in a society. It serves two important purposes. It gives say to social values and strengthens their aspirational dimensions. 
it also helps in guiding human behavior towards desired social ends. Thus, by defining law provides the normative basis and the architecture of the conduct of public policy. Law making or legislation is the exclusive domain of the parliament and the legislative assemblies in our parliamentary democracy. In law making, the easy part is the act of passing a bill. Not so easy when you do not have majority. The harder part is the negotiations for reconciling the interests of different groups for the legislation. A legislature is effective only if it is able to address the differences among stakeholders and succeeds in building a consensus for the law to be enacted and enforced. When the parliament fails in discharging its lawmaking role or enacts law without discussion, it breaches the trust reposed in it by the people. This is neither good for democracy nor for the policies anchored in these laws. Distinguished heads of the institutions, faculty members, and dear students, policy refers to a definite course of action adopted for expediting or facilitating desired results in a given situation. It is normative in nature. These norms come from laws and social practices prevalent in a society or from international conditions that a state becomes party to. Policies have to essentially address the concerns of different stakeholders in a society. In the larger national interest, friends, the policy making in India's context is guided by its constitution. The directive principles of state policy represent affirmative instructions to provide the basis for all executive and legislative action. While these principles are not justiciable, they are fundamental in the governance of the country. In the landmark 1973 judgment in Keshavaranda Bharti, Bharsa State of Kerala, the Supreme Court observed that both directive principles and fundamental rights are equally fundamental, even though directives are not directly enforceable by the courts. In the past decade, people have been given entitlements for right to information, limited job security in rural areas, education, and food through legal guarantee. Each legislative intervention has resulted in a shift in policy towards the objective laid down in our constitutions and in furthering human well-being. Friends, the Parliament having aided policy formulation also ensures that policy and programs that it has helped define through legislation is implemented in the envisaged manner. It exercises oversight to ensure that programs are carried out by the executive legally, effectively, and for the purpose they are intended. Parliamentary oversight extends also to two other important functions. Parliament enjoys exclusive power of total control on money and finance. Every taxation, every receipt and expenditure to and from the Consolidated Fund of India is subject 
to the approval of the Lok Sabha or Vidhan Sabha in case of states. The other important supervisory power of the parliament over the executive is that the highest executive authority, that is the prime minister and the council of ministers function as long as they enjoy the confidence of the popularly elected house and can be removed by a simple majority of the house through a motion of no confidence. According to our constitution, in certain exceptional circumstances, the prime minister can recommend to the president the dissolution of Lok Sabha when composition of the house is fractured and its functioning becomes erratic and incohesive. Therefore, these two very important functions of the executive are subject to the total control of popularly elected house. Friends, the parliament's role in policy articulation, its implementation and oversight is critical. It is therefore incumbent of the members of the parliament to discuss and undertake adequate scrutiny of all business transacted in the house. Unfortunately, the time devoted by the members in parliament has been gradually declining. The first three Lok Sabhas had 677, 581 and 578 sittings respectively. Compared to that, the 13th, 14th and 15th Lok Sabhas had 356, 332 and 357 sittings respectively. We all should hope that the 16th Lok Sabha reverses this trend. Friends, there is a growing tendency to resort to disruption as a means of parliamentary intervention. Dissent is a recognized democratic expression, but disruption leads to loss of time and resources and paralyzes policy formulation. The cardinal principle of parliamentary democracy is that the majority has the mandate to rule while opposition has the right to oppose, expose, and if the number permits, to depose. But under no circumstances should there be disruption of the proceedings. A noisy minority cannot be allowed to gag a patient majority. My dear students, to meet certain exigencies and under compelling circumstances, the framers of the Constitution deemed it necessary to confer limited legislative power upon the executive by way of promulgation of ordinances when the legislature is not in session and circumstances justify immediate legislation. The framers also deemed it necessary to impose certain restrictions on this extraordinary legislative power by constitutionally mandating replacement of such ordinances within a time frame by the legislators. Article 123, Clause 2 provides that an ordinance must be replaced by a law not later than six weeks from the reassembly of the two houses. Article 85 of the Constitution further provides that six months shall not intervene between the last sitting 
of one session and the first sitting of the next session. Distinguished heads of the institutions, faculty members, and dear students, India's diversity and the magnitude of the problems require that the parliament becomes a more effective platform to build consensus on public policies and a bulwark of our democratic ideals. The proceedings in parliament must be conducted in a spirit of cooperation, harmony, and purpose. The content and quality of debates should be of high order. Maintenance of discipline and decorum in the house and observance of etiquette and decency are necessary. The parliament must not yield its space for legislating and policy making to mass mobilization and street protest. For that may not always provide considered solutions to our problems. To retain the trust and faith of the people, the parliament must enact laws to put in place policies that address the concerns and aspirations of the people. Friends, you as educators, researchers, opinion makers, and future leaders have a role to play in contributing to improve the quality of policy making and its implementation. Many amongst you will enter public life to serve the nation. Take time to decide before entering as it is never a short term option. But having decided once, give your best. I conclude by once again wishing you all a very happy and fulfilling year ahead. Let this be a year of great opportunities and success in all that you pursue. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, sir, for enlightening us. Let us go to the question and answer interaction session. Let me invite the student from Jawaharlal Nehru University to present the question before the Honorable President. Good afternoon, Honorable President of India. I am Mr. Umrampa from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. My question is, the Indian constitution adopted a parliamentary system to get the best through consultative and participative legislation making processes but frequent disruption in the parliament and defeating this very purpose what do you think is the remedy to check the frequent disruption in the parliamentary thank you very right question i thank you for putting this question i do believe it is incumbent on both the ruling parties and the opposition parties to sit together and find out a workable solution through which we can avoid disruptions. As I mentioned in my observations, disruption is no way of parliamentary intervention. Disruption only wastes time, energy, and it does not allow others to make their voice heard. Therefore, of course, ruling party has major responsibility as they are to govern, they are to get their ideas reflected in bills to be passed. So they should also take initiative and opposition should cooperate because only informed discussions and dialogue in a spirit of accommodation, give and take, can lead to enactment of laws for the betterment of our people. Therefore, I 
request both the ruling parties and the opposition parties to share your concern, like many people's concern, that disruption should be avoided. Parliament should start functioning smoothly. And once Parliament starts functioning smoothly, I do believe all other institutions will fall in line. Thank you for putting this question. Let me invite the student from Banaras Hindu University <coughs> to present the question before the Honorable President. Good afternoon, sir. I am Sapna Tiwari from Department of Physical Education, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. Honorable sir, one question that often comes to my mind is, the lawmaking process in India has many roadblocks. Bills passed by the Lok Sabha do not pass muster in the Rajya Sabha. The political scenario in the country is such that the ruling party does not have numbers in the Rajya Sabha that would enable the in smooth passage of bills. What, according to you, is the likely way out of this impasse and predicament? Thank you. Thank you. And this has posed a real serious problem. It is not necessary that the ruling party will have majority in both the houses. Lok Sabha and Raj Sabha. Lok Sabha, it is mandatory for the ruling party to have majority, otherwise they don't have the mandate to rule. But in Raj Sabha, it is not mandatory. And in fact, what you will have to keep in mind the composition of the Raj Sabha. Raj Sabha represents the states. And there is a particular formula which was evolved during the drafting of the constitution, how the members, number of members of the Raj Sabha will be determined. And therefore, the more popular state, as per that formula, have more members in Raj Sabha, and they are elected by the state assembly, not directly by the people. Therefore, the ruling party of the state determines who will be the representatives from that state, although there is proportional representative system, but the majority party gets the majority share of the seats from that state. Now, if you look at the practical problem today which all political parties, in fact the entire political establishment is suffering from, I am not mentioning the states, you can know it very easily, all major states are dominated by the regional parties, but national scenario is dominated by the national party. Those national parties do not have their presence very much. One or two states they may have, but in the major states which send the bulk of representation to Raj Sabha are ruled by regional party for a very long period of time. Take the case of Tamil Nadu or West Bengal. Tamil Nadu from 1967 onwards. West Bengal from 1967 onwards, except for a very short intervention of 72 to 77, are ruled by regional parties. From 90s onwards, UP Bihar have joined there. Therefore, the representation representing these states in addition to Andhra and Maharashtra, which constitute the majority of the members in both the houses, the regional parties are very important players in that Sabha. Therefore, the practical solution lies and who is the father of constitution thought and our political establishment will have to find out a solution by working together, sharing ideas, putting their heads together that how to resolve this issue. Because for legislation, a requirement of both the houses, consent of both the houses are required. In exceptional cases like 
money and finance will that so has no power they are just to deter constitutional amendment they have equal power but in all other legislations they have the power therefore their consent is required to avoid an extreme cases may be suggested through the joint session which is a constitutional provision but it is not practicable because i have seen from 1952 till today only four times laws were passed by joint session therefore i am repeating what i have stated earlier that it is the responsibility on the entire political establishment of the country to put their heads together and to work out a workable solution where opposition can play the role of oppose expose and if possible dispose but always to keep in mind that legislation is the collective responsibility of the elected members of the houses directly directly elected in lok sabha elected by state assemblies in nat sabha but nonetheless it is the collective responsibility and i urge the political establishment to engage themselves in dialogue and find out a practical solution thank you i am obliged sir let me invite the student from iit guwahati to present the question before the honorable president good afternoon to honorable president sir and vice chancellors and directors of various institutes professors and my uh, colleague i mean my fellow students uh, today i om prakash reddy from iit guwahati would take an honor to ask a question to honorable president sir in the recent past it has been seen that there is propensity for the executive to utilize the ordinance route to enact the legislature sir do you think the frequent resort to this result follows the spirit of constitution of course ordinance route cannot be taken should not be taken for not by legislation constitution provides proclamation of ordinances in an extraordinary situation where immediate legislation is necessary but houses are not in session therefore the executive has been empowered with this extraordinary power to proclaim ordinance to meet the requirement of immediate legislation but there is a constitutional provision article 123 clause 2 in case of parliament and there are relevant provisions in case of state assembly that an ordinance will have to be replaced by a regular law within 6 weeks from the re assembly of the house and if it is not passed within 6 weeks of the re assembly of the houses ordinances will lapse it will have no validity therefore the government when it is issuing ordinances are also taking the risk of getting it lapsed if they cannot get it approved by the houses both lok sabha and rajya sabha and in fact if you go through the debate of the constituent assembly you will find very interesting comments one of the very eminent member of constituent assembly professor k t sha he raised very pertinent questions that what is the guarantee that executive will not take longer time through ordinance route to avoid parliament and in fact to his insistence and certain other members the framers of the constitution ultimately agreed to provide two safeguards which are there in the constitution one i have mentioned already article 123 clause 2 of the constitution in respect of parliament 
time limit is six weeks from the reassembly of the house. And another is, you cannot delay convening the parliament, houses of parliament. There is another provision under Article 85 of the Constitution that the distance between the last day of the last session and the first day of the next session, the time should not be more than six months. That means within six months you are compelled to call the house. Therefore, these two constitutional guarantees ensure that executive cannot resort to ordinance rules. And ordinances are meant for a specific purpose to meet an extraordinary situation under extraordinary circumstances. Thank you. So thank you for giving this opportunity. Let me invite the student from IIT Kanpur to present the question before the Honorable President. Uh, sir, good afternoon from IIT Kanpur. It is a great privilege to ask your question on behalf of the IIT Kanpur student community. Uh, my question is the following. Experience in the last few years shows that important financial legislations are enacted by Parliament without de debate and careful scrutiny. Sir, in your opinion, what should be done to ensure that the budget making process is participative and takes into account the interest of the people? Very appropriate question, particularly I do hope my colleague finance minister is listening to this debate and particularly listening to your question. I would like to answer your question by giving some personal experiences also. Over the years, budget making process has been the exclusive domain, what we may call an exclusive club. Prime Minister, one of his secretary whom he dominates, nominates, finance minister, and about four or five senior officers of the finance minister who help him in formulating the budgetary proposals. They prepare the entire financial proposals contained in the budget. Even the cabinet is not privy to know. Sometimes some departmental ministers may give some suggestions to the finance minister. But mainly their suggestion comes through the demand of more funds to be allocated to their respective ministries. But the overall content, financial policies, economic policies, these are determined by the finance minister with the approval of the prime minister. Of course, there are documents like earlier days planning commission's document, five-year plans. Now they have established a new institutions and they will find out what would be there. Uh, policy formulations through these new institutions. Ruling party, they have their manifesto where they explain their economic and monetary policies. So these are the available documents to the finance minister and of course the prevailing situation which he analyzes in consultation with his officers and prime minister. But prior to that also, a system has been initiated, and if I remember correctly, perhaps it started from 1982 during my tenure as first time finance minister in the government of Indira Gandhi. I started consulting various groups, economists, trade union leaders, leaders of the industry and commerce, and farmers organizations and experts in agriculture. Over the years, this practice continue and it is called pre-budget consultation. You might have seen in the television or read in the newspaper that present finance minister is engaged in having discussions with various stakeholders. 
so they also give their input therefore the budgetary process could be participative as it can also be shared with the people for instance i remember if i remember correctly in 1985 when the then finance minister mr vishwanath pratap singh presented his budget he gave a long term fiscal policy he outlined what would be his taxation policy for a period of he expected that he will be for finance minister for 5 years so the rate of mortality in the finance ministry is very high hardly you will find <laughs> except dr monmohan singh and perhaps mr jashwant sinha nobody has and now mr chidambaram has given uh, a large number of budgets therefore the rate of mortality is very high but he tried to make an effort that long term fiscal policy but that is not being practiced by the others but i do feel if parliament devotes more time for discussion on budget and budgetary proposals demands for grants and thereafter when the parliament is not in session the appropriate standing committee discuss in details the demands for the respective ministries and they place their reports in the normally monsoon se um, second leg of the budget session then these could also be discussed so alternative lies to have detailed discussions in the floor of the house post budget scrutiny report of the public accounts committee estimates committee report before formulating of the budget and public undertaking committee's report about the functioning of the public sector industries where huge investment has been made through these i do feel to some extent the participating arrangement of budgetary process could be achieved i thank you for this very searching and enlightened questions i do really appreciate it thank you let me invite dr saban patasharya director nit surat kal to propose what are thanks namaskar and very good afternoon respected honorable president of india sri pranab mukherjee sir on behalf of all the participants of today's program it is my privilege to offer thanks and gratitude to you for this address sir at a time when we all associated with the higher education system are working hard for transforming the system with primary focus on responsiveness to society relevance to industries and global competitiveness your invaluable guidance would be of immense help in dynamically setting the road map towards achieving this target so establishing connectivity across the length and breadth of our country that to characterized by huge amount of heterogeneity diversity and complexity is by no means a trivial job i would like to thank the team of nic and NK, nkn for making it happen we have done a tremendous job so i would also like to thank all the directors vice chancellors faculty members staff members and of course the students for overwhelming participation in today's program so i would also like to thank the entire team of the rashtrapati bhavan and ministry of human resource development for making today's program happen so the greatest asset of our country happens to be the large young population with energetic mind it is our collective responsibility to derive maximum out of 
this demographic, the demographic dividend. They all are equipped with the acumen to take maximum out of digital era. They also are ready to take charge. So after today's address, they are also enlightened with the process of governance of our country. That too, sir, right from the Honorable President of India. This would definitely energize and motivate them further to lead the nation in near future. And I do believe this is the greatest takeaway of today's program. Thank you, sir. May I request everybody to rise for the national anthem.